first. So hello everyone and welcome to the Cloud Lunch and Learn sessions. My name is Hugo Barona and today we have Vabav with us talking about Azure networking. So I hand over to you, Vabav. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, before we start, just wanted to uh, uh, get a pulse on if you can hear me well. If you are not able to hear me or if you see any issues, please let me or you, you know, we will be able to help you out. With that, let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, uh, depending upon where you are listening us from. Thank you for joining us live today for this session. If you are watching it later on demand, I welcome you as well. I would like to thank Hugo for giving me an opportunity to speak in this lunch and lunch session. If you don't follow him, I recommend you to follow him and support Cloud Lunch and Learn initiative that he is leading. I'm going to talk about a topic which has been haunting me for years. Uh, I come from application development background and I have never spent too much of time on learning networking in my initial days. My focus has been programming back in those days, but working on cloud changes everything. If you have worked on uh, applications running on cloud, you ought to know the networking aspects of cloud, and I'm going to make it easy for you today. I don't really anticipate that you will be becoming an expert in Azure networking after my session today, but what I can assure you is that I will share enough information with you today that will be helpful to you in your learning process. With that couple of guidelines, I would prefer to take Q and A's at the end of my presentation so that I don't miss on sharing anything that I have planned for. If you get a question or doubt in between the presentation, please feel free to post it on the chat window and I'll get back to those at the end of the presentation. With that, let me uh, start with my introduction. My name is Vabha Gujral. I have 40, 14 years of experience working on enterprise class applications. I'm a Microsoft certified Azure Solutions Architect expert, and I also hold few other Azure certifications. I'm currently working for Kivit as a cloud architect. If you don't know, uh, Kivit is one of the largest construction companies in the United States. I'm also an organizer at Omaha Azure User Group, which has over 700 community members in our meetup group. And as an organizer, I do organize user group meetings and manage user groups, website, YouTube channel, Slack, workspace, Twitter handle, and LinkedIn group as well. Please feel free to join the community if you have not already. I'm a regular speaker at several local user groups and events speaking on Azure related topics. I also blog on webagujral.com. You can follow me on my Twitter handle, webgujral. With further ado, let, uh, let's jump onto the agenda to go through what we are going to talk today. We are going to start with very basic. We'll see what an Azure region is. Then we'll talk about virtual networks, VPN gateways, network security, or filtering and routing. I'll briefly touch upon the different load balancing options we have in Azure, and I'll conclude the session with how we can monitor our network traffic. I intend to cover a couple of quick demos as well. The intent is to wrap up the session five or 10 minutes early so that I can answer some of the questions if you have. A quick disclaimer, I have used uh, most of the figures during this presentation from Microsoft documentation, so I just wanted to attribute those. With that, let's, let's get started. I wanted to start with very basic first. When I speak with many folks, one of my observations has been that they don't understand what an Azure region is. They often relate region and a data center as same, which is not correct. Everything in Azure starts with a data center, which is analogous to your on-prem data center if you have one. A data center is nothing but a building or group of buildings that is used to host uh, or house your physical infrastructure, including racks, network switches, etc. Uh, whereas a region in Azure is a collection of those data centers deployed within proximity with a network latency under two milliseconds. The data centers within a region could be a few miles uh, apart, up to 100 to 200 miles apart, but they are under the, in the same region. Now, another thing to note here is that Microsoft grouped these regions under geographies strictly to comply with data residency and other laws. Geographies are fault tolerant to withstand uh, complete region failure through their connection to Microsoft's uh, 
in networking infrastructure, meaning if one region goes down, the complete geography doesn't go down. There is at least a region up and running in each of the geographies. Lastly, availability zones uh, is a concept that you should be aware of when you're speaking of Azure regions and data centers. Availability zones are physically separate locations within an Azure region. Each availability zone is made up of one or more data centers equipped with independent power, cooling, and networking. It's a feature which is very handy in case you are uh, planning for high availability and disaster recovery. Moving on, what you see here is different geographies with their corresponding regions. There are six geographies altogether, Americas, Europe, Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa, Azure government and Azure China. Each of these geographies, as you can see, have multiple regions within them, making each of these geographies fault tolerant. For example, in Americas, there are 11 regions ranging from East US, East US 2 and so on. In Europe, there are 15 regions and in Asia, there are 13 regions. Probably this gives a better view of the different regions in different geographies. The blue dots here are the regions that are available for consumption, meaning you can deploy your services in any of the available regions. The one with the dotted circles are the regions which are announced and are going to be available in recent future. And then there are few circles with a diamond in them. It indicates that those regions have availability zones, which you can select while you are configuring your Azure resources. Uh, one last note here, when you choose a region to deploy your resources to, there are few considerations to keep in mind. Certainly for data compliance and regulatory reasons, you might have to choose a particular region. But you should also keep in mind that not all the services are available in all the region. Please refer to the link provided up there uh, to check the latest list of available products and what services are available in which region. So now here is a snapshot of how many services Azure offers today. On the lower bottom is the Azure Data Center infrastructure, which is the physical infrastructure owned and managed by Microsoft. On top of that, you have infrastructure services categorized into three categories, compute, storage, and networking. On top of that, you have all the different platform services which are customized to suit different needs like web, IoT, AI, and so on. On the left side is the suite of management services, which you can use for managing your Azure environment efficiently. These include services like Azure Monitor, Azure Blueprints, Policies, Azure Cost Management, and so on. Lastly, on the right side, uh, there are security services like Azure AD, which is a cloud-based identity store, and Azure Key Vault, which is a secure key management service. Anyways, uh, what we are going to focus today is the are the networking services. As mentioned earlier, we will look into some of these services like virtual network, VPN gateway, express route, load balancer, and so on. Let's talk about a virtual network. It's a fundamental building block for your private network in Azure. Being a private network, it brings isolation on top of other Azure features like scalability and availability. You can place our Azure resources inside a virtual network to securely communicate with each other or with the internet traffic or with your on-prem networks. A virtual network is analogous to a traditional network that you would uh, manage and operate in your on-prem data centers. When you create a virtual network, you define a RFC 1918 IP address space. If you are not aware of what it is, I would highly encourage you to read about it. In a nutshell, it specifies the best practices for defining your private networks. Basically, it categorizes the different IP addresses that an enterprise might need or use into three categories. And starting with the first category where they place the hosts that don't require access to uh, other hosts or other enterprises or any, anything outside their own enterprise. In such environments, the IP address ranges are, are unique within the enterprise, but they can overlap outside the enterprise. Then the second uh, category of hosts are the ones which need limited access outside their enterprise for scenarios like email or FTP and so on. So similar to the category one host, which do doesn't have any access to outside environment, these ones which have limited uh, access have unique IP addresses within their enterprise, but their IP addresses might conflict or overlap with outside their enterprise. Lastly, as per RFC 1918, they list 
the third category of host which have network layer access to resources outside the enterprise which means they just don't need to have unique ip addresses locally but they also need to have ip addresses unique globally anyways coming back to this slide rfc 1918 standard allows three different ip ranges that we can use in any private network which are listed on the screen starting from 10.0.0.0 172.16.0.0 and 192.168.0.0. So when creating a virtual network, the ranges that I have listed there are the ranges you can specify that you can use. And then you have to uh, specify or define those IP address ranges while creating a virtual network in CIDR notation, which is basically based on the idea of subnet masks. It requires you to provide IP ranges in two parts, a network identifying prefix and a host identifier within that network. The highest prefix could be slash 32, and the number of IP addresses double with every reducing prefix. Uh, for example, the uh, IP address range that you are seeing on your screen here, 192.168.100.14/24, uses 24 as a prefix, which denotes 256 IP addresses, ranging from 192.168.100.0 to 100.255. Within a virtual network, there is a limit that we can only have up to 65,536 private IP addresses. What that translates into is that the minimum prefix that it can go down up to is slash 16. You cannot go beyond slash 16. Now moving on, once you have, identi once you have identified the IP range for your virtual network, you can further segment your virtual network using a concept called subnets. If you have networking background, you understand what a subnet is and for Azure Virtual Network, the concept doesn't change. Subnets and virtual networks are used for network segmentation. You can have up to 3000 subnets within a virtual network. The traffic is enabled by default between the subnets within a virtual network, but you can use NSGs to control the traffic flow. It is important to understand that a virtual network is scoped to a single region and subscription. What you are seeing here in this diagram is how it is laid out. When you create a subscription within an Azure region and a subscription, you have a resource group within which you create a virtual network. And within virtual network, you have multiple subnets and you can create resources under each of those subnets. Why scope is important here is because of a couple of things. Uh, the first primary reason being you cannot have a virtual network with same name in the same scope. So for uh, naming uh, two different virtual networks in the same scope, you need two different names. You cannot share the same name. And secondly, it is important to plan your virtual networks across different regions and subscriptions, because if you intend to uh, connect two different VNets, which we are going to talk through in upcoming slide anyways, they cannot have overlapping IP addresses. In other words, you cannot connect two virtual networks with overlapping IP address ranges due to the obvious reason. All resources in a virtual network can communicate outbound to the internet by default. You can use something like network security group to restrict network traffic at some net level. We'll be looking into NSGs in later slides, and if you need to enable inbound communication to your resources from internet, you can do so by assigning a public IP address or a public load balancer on top of your virtual network. You can also uh, use public IP or public load balancer to just not to manage inbound communications, but also to manage your outbound communications from your virtual network. Uh, there are some best practices which uh, I recommend you should follow when you are creating and planning your virtual networks in Azure. To start with, as I was saying in the last slide, avoid non-overlapping address spaces, as if you intend to connect multiple virtual networks, if they have overlapping address spaces, you cannot connect them. Second, ensure that subnets don't cover the entire address space of the virtual network. Uh, you should reserve some address space for the future requirements so that you should be able to spin up additional uh, subnets whenever a need arises. And that being said, it doesn't mean you should break down your uh, virtual network into uh, many small virtual networks. It's better to have uh, fewer large virtual networks than multiple small virtual networks or the subnets to avoid management issues as well. Uh, 
Lastly, you should secure your virtual networks with network security groups, which we are going to touch upon in the later slide. I have listed down a link over there, so if you can follow that, you can uh, go through the guidance on how to better plan your virtual networks and place your resources within the Azure Virtual Network. Moving on, uh, we have seen what a virtual network is. Let's talk about what our VPN gateway is. A VPN gateway is a specific type of virtual network gateway that is used to send encrypted traffic between an Azure net virtual network and an on-prem location over the public internet. You can also use a VPN gateway to send encrypted traffic between Azure virtual networks over the Microsoft network. Uh, each virtual network can have only one VPN gateway. However, you can create multiple connections to the same VPN gateway. When you create multiple connections to the same VPN gateway, uh, please note that all the VPN tunnels share the available gateway bandwidth. There are two types of VPN gateways that uh, you can create in Azure. Uh, the first one is VPN and the second one is Express Route. Each VPN can have only one VPN gateway, whereas a VPN gateway, as I was saying, can have multiple connections. Now that even, as I said, even a V, even though a VNet can have just one VPN gateway of type VPN, it can also have one additional Express Route gateway, meaning a v, v virtual network can have two what, VPN gateways of one of each type listed on this slide. When you create a VPN gateway and attach it to a virtual network, it creates an exclusive subnet called as gateway subnet in which the virtual network, uh, sorry, in which the resources required by the gateway are created. Moving on, a VPN gateway supports different connectivity scenarios like uh, you can connect your virtual networks, meaning you can connect a virtual network to another virtual network in your Azure environment, uh, and those virtual networks can be in same or different regions, same or different subscriptions, or they can use same or different deployment models. If you are not aware of different deployment models in Azure, there are two, Classic and ARM. ARM stands for Azure Resource Manager, which is the current standard and all the resources before ARM were before ARM was launched are called classic. You cannot create classic resources anymore, but if you have existing classic virtual networks, you can connect them with each other or with ARM based virtual networks using VPN gateway. What you are seeing on the diagram uh, on the lower uh, side of the slide is shows a VNet to VNet gateway. What it basically does is it creates an IPsec VPN tunnel between two virtual networks. A VPN gateway sits in front of each of the VNets and VPN gateways talk to each other to enable communication between the two virtual networks. Moving on, we can also establish a site to site VPN gateway connection. It provides uh, a connection over IPsec VPN tunnel similar to VNet to VNet. Uh, site to site connections can be used for cross premises and hybrid configurations uh, where you want to connect your on prem resources with Azure. A site to site connection requires a VPN device to, uh, to be located and installed on prem that has a public IP address assigned to it. You can also extend site to site, ex uh, site, -to -site connection into a multi-site connection where you can connect your multiple sites like your branch offices or department offices with Azure Virtual Network. Please note that you need to have a VPN device located as, at each of these locations, and each of the tunnel that you are seeing here shares the available bandwidth at the gateway, which I believe maxes out at one gigabytes per second. Similar to a site-to-site -site VPN gateway, you can also have a point to site connectivity between your Azure virtual network and your remote client computers. It is similar to how we connect to our VPNs for our office from our home. Uh, we have to install a VPN client at each of our uh, remote computers. And, um, to, and for the connection it, between VPN gateway and the VPN client, a tunnel is established for each of the remote computers. And as I was mentioning in site to site as well, uh, it's the same case here. Each of the tunnels here share the same bandwidth at the VPN gateway level. Now, uh, I have mentioned it earlier that one way to connect your virtual networks is using VNet to VNet connectivity using a VPN gateway. 
but uh, they are not the best way to do it. They are the recommended way when you have cross premises requirements where you have to or the hybrid requirements where you want intend to connect your on prem environments with Azure. If you intend to connect your virtual networks with each other, then the recommended way is to connect multiple VNets with, through something known as virtual network peering, where you can peer one virtual network into another. The outcome is that the IP address ranges of the virtual network peers appear as one single virtual network. And the resources between both the virtual networks can then start communicating with each other with minimal latency as they would have done with the other resources within the same virtual network. Now, depending upon the location of the virtual network or the region in which the virtual network peers are in, the peering falls under one of the two categories. If both your virtual networks are in the same region, let's say East US, it is counted as virtual network peering. If the virtual network are in different regions, it is counted as global network peering. You need to be aware of the cost implications for both. For virtual network peering, you pay for inbound and outbound data transfer at both virtual networks. And comparatively, the cost for global peering is more than intra-region VNet peering due to the obvious reason because it leaves the region. Another, another thing to note here is that uh, VNet peerings are not transitive. What you see in the diagram is how you can connect your different virtual networks with each other. Here, virtual network A is peered with virtual network B, which is in turn peered with virtual network C. You should note here that virtual network B can communicate with both virtual network A and C, but virtual network A and C cannot communicate with each other, and they can only communicate with the virtual network B. Lastly, both the peering supports gateway transit. What gateway transit means is if I have a VPN gateway attached to a virtual network, and the virtual network is peered with another virtual network, then the peered virtual network can opt for gateway transit and use the remote gateway, which is assigned with the virtual network one. What I'm showing here is a hub and spoke topology, which you can extend to connect your on-prem networks with your Azure virtual uh, networks. What you're seeing here is on the left side, you have a hub virtual network, which is connected to your on-prem network over VPN gateway. And then your hub virtual network is peered with different spoke virtual networks, which have your uh, different Azure resources running in there. For more details on this uh, topology, you can visit that link where they have uh, listed all the details, the reference architecture, as well as the deployment ARM template. Moving on, the another uh, option that you have to connect your on-prem environment with Azure virtual networks is known as Express Route, which provides layer, layer three connectivity between your on-prem networks and the Microsoft Cloud over a private connect connection, uh, facilitated by a connectivity provider. With Express Route, you can also establish connections to Microsoft services like Office 365. Connectivity can be from any to any network or a point to point Ethernet network, or it could be a virtual cross connection through a connectivity provider at a co-location facility. Express route connections do not go over the public internet. Uh, this allows express route connections to offer more uh, reliability, faster speeds, and higher security. Uh, you should note that Microsoft uses BGP, uh, which is uh, an industry standard uh, dynamic routing protocol. It is used to exchange routes between your on-prem network with your instances in Azure and multi Microsoft public addresses. Each express route consists of two connections to uh, two Microsoft Enterprise Edge routers, as you can see in the diagram. Microsoft requires dual uh, BGP connection, as you can see between Partner Edge and the Microsoft Edge there. Uh, the primary reason being Microsoft wants to ensure that connections are handed off in a redundant manner. And if one connection goes down, the second one can take over as a failover. And then each circuit has a fixed bandwidth that you can opt from 50 Mbps to 10 gigs per, per second. The important point to note here is that uh, the bandwidth is shared across all the circuit peerings that you establish. Uh, I'm going to talk about the peerings in the next slide. It comes with two different pricing models when you create an express route circuit in Azure portal. Uh, starting with the metered and unmetered, 
uh, as the name suggests, under metered, uh, data outbound transfer is metered. Whereas in under unmetered, the, there is a fixed cost for the express route and the outbound data transfer is not metered. And when I said uh, for both metered and unmetered, outbound data transfer, you should note that uh, for any Azure uh, resource, the inbound data transfer is always free and Microsoft charges us for the outbound data transfer. Uh, lastly, uh, you should also check out a couple of other options in Express Route. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, the default mechanism in Express Route is to use uh, or facilitate a connectivity provider in between or a partner who establishes the connectivity between customers network to the Microsoft Edge device. You can use something known as Express Route Direct, where you can connect directly to Microsoft Global Network without the need of an intermediate uh, connectivity provider. Another option you have is Express Route Global Reach, uh, where you can link your uh, multiple Express Route circuits in different regions together to make a private network between your on-prem networks. Express Route supports two independent peerings, known as private peering and Microsoft peering. What each of these pairing means is with private, you can connect to your private Azure virtual machines and the cloud services that are running within your virtual network. The private peering domain is considered to be a trusted extension of your core network into Microsoft Azure. The peering lets you connect to virtual machines and cloud services directly on their private IP addresses from, their, from your virtual network. And the second uh, other other type of peering is Microsoft peering, which lets you connect to Microsoft online services like Office 365. And you can also connect to other Azure PaaS services outside your virtual network uh, through the Microsoft peering. Now, if you have already have been using Express routes in the past, you might see the three different kinds of peerings, Azure Public, Azure Private, and Microsoft. Uh, Azure services were categorized as Azure Public and Azure Private in the past to represent the IP addressing schemes. Now IP Private, Azure Private remains the private peering, whereas Azure Public peering has been merged with Microsoft peering. Uh, now you have to understand that each peering here is an independent, is a pair of independent BGP sessions, each of them configured redundancy for high availability. There is a one is to n mapping between an express route circuit and the routing domains. An express route circuit can have uh, one or two peerings enabled per express route circuit, meaning you can either have private peering or Microsoft peering or both. You can create a connection between your on-prem network and the Microsoft Cloud in three different ways. Uh, you can either opt for a co-location facility with a cloud exchange where you can order virtual cross connections to the Microsoft Cloud through the co-location providers Ethernet exchange. Uh, likewise, you can also have a point-to-point -point Ethernet link for layer two or layer three connections over Express Route. Lastly, you can also integrate your WAN with the Microsoft Cloud over Express Route. Microsoft has a global network with Express Route connectivity providers and system integrators. To get the location-wise list, you, sh you should check out the list a link that I have listed down there. Moving on, uh, when I mentioned about Express Route and VPN gateways, uh, those are the two different ways you can use to connect your on-prem networks with Azure. That being said, you can connect an on-prem network to an Azure virtual network through a Express Route and VPN gateway as a failover setup. As per this diagram, traffic flows between the on-prem network and the Azure virtual network through an express route connection generally. But if there is a loss of connectivity in the express route circuit, traffic is then routed through an IPsec VPN tunnel, which is established through VPN gateway. I have given the link down there for the uh, reference architecture, which you can refer to and uh, set up the resources. It comes with a deployment template as well. Moving on, there is another networking service called as Azure Virtual WAN, which brings many networking security and routing functionalities together to provide a single operational interface. These functionalities include branch connectivity, site-to-site -site VPN connectivity, point-to-site connectivity, uh, Express Route connectivity, Infra Cloud connectivity, Azure Firewall and encryption for private connectivity. Now you don't have to use uh, all of these features together and you can use a subset of the features depending upon your use case. Uh, what you have to understand here is that the virtual WAN architecture is a hub and spoke architecture with scale and performance built in for your branches, users, Express Route circuits and the virtual networks. 
as depicted in the diagram here, Azure region serves as the hubs that you can choose to connect to from your different branches and uh, express route circuits. All hubs uh, that you are seeing here are connected in full mesh in a standard virtual van, making it easy for your users to use the Microsoft um, backbone network for any to any connectivity, including site to set, point to point, or point to site or express route. Moving on, I would like to touch upon few other features as well, which are part of virtual networks. These features are very handy to connect your Azure services privately and securely. To start with, there is a feature called as Service Endpoint, which allows your resources within your virtual network to reach out to other Azure services with a private IP address. You just need to enable the Service Endpoint on a subnet for the particular Azure resource that you would like to connect from your virtual network. As you can see in the diagram, your virtual machine that sits in a subnet within a virtual network can connect to the Azure storage through a service endpoint over public IP, and it doesn't need to come through internet and use a public IP address. Uh, there is no additional cost for using a service endpoint, and it comes within a virtual network, so feel free to use it. And another service I want to mention about is called private links or endpoints, which enables access to Azure Pass services over a private endpoint in your virtual network. The traffic flows on the Microsoft Backbone network, and there is no need to expose your services to the public internet. Microsoft has already announced support for private endpoints with some of the services like Azure Storage and SQL databases. For some of the Pass services like App Services, it is in public preview and is expected to go GA soon. The feature is very powerful, and I expect the list of supporting services to keep growing over the time. Lastly, I want also like to mention about a feature known as Virtual Network uh, NAT or Network Address Translation. Many times there is a requirement to expose a single static public IP address on outbound communication from all the resources running inside a virtual network or a subnet. For such scenarios, you can use Virtual Network NAT which once enabled forces all the UDP and TCP traffic to flow from the resources under the subnet to use NAT and show the static public IP address. Now you can opt for a single static public IP or you can opt for a public IP prefix. To configure uh, virtual network NAT, you just need to set up a NAT gateway with a public IP address or a IP, IP prefix and assign it to the appropriate subnet that you want the translation to happen. Now we have covered the different uh, networking services that are available in Azure. Let's, let's talk about network security and filtering. First service that I want to talk about is network security groups. You can use Azure networking security groups, uh, network security groups to filter network traffic to and from Azure resources in an Azure virtual network. A network security group contains security rules that allow or deny inbound, net, inbound network traffic or outbound network traffic from your Azure resources. For each rule, you can specify source and destination, port and protocol. When you create an NSG, there are some default security rules which gets created automatically, and you can override them with your own security rules with a higher priority. You can also have augmented security rules within an NSG, which allow you to define larger and complex network security policies with fewer rules. For example, you can use something like service tags, that represent a group of IP address prefixes from a given Azure service like Azure App Services or Azure Storage and so on. Network security group sec uh, security rules are evaluated by priority using a uh, five tuple information, which includes source, source port, destination, destination port, and protocol. Uh, it, NSG uses security rules to allow or deny the traffic. As you can see in the figure, energy can be applied at a NIC level or network interface level or at a subnet level. To the left, you see uh, there is an NSG at, an, at NIC level as well as at the subnet level for VM1. All the security rules in both the NSGs are evaluated and given preference depending upon the direction of the communication. For in, inbound, it first evaluates the rule at the subnet level and then at the NIC level. If the traffic is allowed at the subnet level but not at the NIC level, the traffic is denied. Likewise, in the outbound communication from VM1, 
the rules at the NIC level are evaluated first, and then the rules at the subnet uh, are evaluated. For Virtual Machine 2, there is no NSG at NIC level, and the rules from subnet NSG applies to all the traffic. For Virtual Machine 3, there is no NSG at the subnet level, and there is one at the NIC level. So the rules at the NIC level NSG applies for all the traffic. Lastly, for VM4, there is no NSG assigned and all the traffic flows without any security rules. Now the challenge with uh, network security groups is that you have to base your network security policies on your IP address ranges, which is okay in most of the cases, but sometimes it gets tricky to set up the network security policies that align with the application structure. Meaning if I have to group virtual machines and define network security policies based on those groups, it is not possible or at least not very intuitive in network security groups. The problem is resolved using uh, what is known as application security groups, which allow us to configure the network security policies as an extension of our application structure. Uh, what you are seeing here in the figure is NIC1 and NIC2 are the two network interfaces, which are members of an application security group called as ASG Web. NIC3 is a member of ASG Logic application security group, and then NIC4 is a member of ASG DB application security group. Uh, now VM1, VM2, VM3 uh, sits in a different subnet, and VM4 sits in a different subnet inside the single virtual network. Now, uh, none of the network interfaces have an associated network security group assigned to it. So NSG1 is, now you have to see here that NSG1 is associated to both the subnets, subnet one and subnet two, and contain certain rules with the application security group as either the source or destination. So the advantage that you get out of uh, creating those security rules assigned to an application security group rather than to a NIC or subnet, is that the rule applies to all the NICs that are assigned to the application security group. For example, if in my NSG1, if I define a rule with a source or destination as ASG web, it, it applies the rule on both virtual machine one and virtual machine two and not on the virtual machine three. Whereas if we have applied a security rule as part of NSG on the subnet one, it would have applied it on all the three different virtual machines, one, two, and three. So application security groups does give us control uh, where we can uh, base our network security policies on our application structure rather than the underlying IP address rates ranges. Moving on, there is another uh, security feature and security service that we can leverage, which is known as Azure Firewall. You can use Azure Firewall to secure your Azure virtual network resources. It is a fully managed cloud-based network security service. It is a fully stateful firewall as a service that comes with a uh, with built-in high availability and unrestricted cloud scalability. Like any other firewall, you can define application rules to allow network traffic through your firewall. I mean, it's not only allow, but you can allow or deny your traffic through your firewall. Now, moving to distributed denial of service attacks, uh, even our Azure resources are not, uh, not away from them. We have to have our DDoS protection in place to protect our resources, and you can leverage Azure DDoS protection to protect your Azure resources from distributed denial of service attacks. By default, basic DDoS protection is enabled, uh, included with most of the Azure services, and is provided free of cost from Microsoft. You can also opt for standard tier for Azure DDoS protection, which comes with additional support options and features. But in my opinion, for most of the use cases I have worked on, basic DDoS protection is more than suffice. Let's talk about how we have understood what a virtual network is, what VPN gateway is, how the network is established in Azure. Now let's see how, traffic, how the routing is established within a virtual network. When a subnet is created within a virtual network, a route table is created by Azure with system default routes uh, already added to the table. Azure system default routes can be add overridden with custom routes. Uh, you can also add additional custom routes as well. All the outbound traffic from a subnet is routed based on the routes in the subnet's route table. What you say here is the list of the default routes that are added to the route table for a subnet. As you can see, each route contains an address prefix and the next hop type. Uh, when, the, when the traffic leaving a subnet is sent 
to an IP address within the address prefix of a route. The route that contains the prefix is the route Azure uses. Now in the uh, uh, diagram, you can see there are three next hop types, virtual network, internet, and none. As the name suggests, for virtual network next hop type, the traffic is routed between the address ranges within the address spaces of a virtual network. For each address range in a virtual network, there is a separate route created for each address range. Now notice that it adds a route for the virtual network address ranges and not for the specific subnet ranges because uh, the subnet IP ranges are already covered under the virtual network IP address ranges. For the internet next hop type, the traffic is routed to the internet. The system default route specifies the 0.0.0.0/0 address prefix, which can be overridden by adding a custom route in the table. All the outbound traffic to the internet is routed to internet through this route, except in one scenario, uh, the public facing Azure services. Azure routes the traffic to the public facing Azure services directly on the Azure backbone network rather than sending it over the internet, regardless of the region or the virtual network the service might be in. Lastly, the uh, traffic routed to none next hop type is dropped. Azure automatically creates default routes for RFC 1918 IP address prefixes, meaning if you send traffic on private IP addresses outside your virtual network address range, it is automatically dropped. Uh, when you extend your virtual network address ranges to include additional IP addresses, the traffic on these IP addresses is automatically routed to the virtual network next hop type. Now Azure also adds uh, additional default rules to support different Azure capabilities that we have talked about earlier, like virtual network peering and VPN gateway. When you create a virtual network peering between two virtual networks, a route is added for each address range within the address space of each of the virtual network uh, peering with the next hop type as the VNet peering. One or more routes with virtual network gateway listed as the next hop type are added as well when a network when a virtual network gateway is added to a virtual network. The source is also virtual network gateway because the gateway adds the routes to the subnet. If you are using uh, express routes to connect your on-prem networks with Azure, uh, the recommended way is to use uh, BGP routes and not the v virtual network gateway routes as depicted in here. It is recommended that you summarize on-prem routes to the largest address ranges possible so that the fewest number of routes are propagated to an Azure Virtual Network Gateway. Another uh, next and the next next top type you see here is Virtual Network Service Endpoint. I did touch upon service endpoint in one of the last slides. Uh, the public IP addresses for certain services are added to this route table by Azure when you enable a service endpoint to a particular service. Service endpoints are enabled for individual subnets within a virtual network, so the route is only added to the route table of a subnet a service endpoint is enabled for. The public IP addresses of Azure services change periodically, and Azure automatically manages the addresses in the route table when the address changes. Now, there are situations when you need to either override Azure default routes or add additional routes. You can do so by adding your custom user-defined routes to the route table. You can create up to 400 user defined routes inside a route table. You can specify a variety of next hop types in your user defined routes, like a virtual appliance, to route the traffic to a network virtual appliance. You can use virtual network gateway as a next hop type when the traffic is destined for specific address prefixes routed to a virtual network gateway. The virtual network gateway must be created with the type VPN if you intend to use virtual network gateway as the VPN uh, as the next hop type, as I mentioned in the last slide. Uh, you cannot specify a virtual network gateway hop type as uh, for a virtual network gateway for with that is created as an express route gateway because with express route, as I was saying earlier, you must use BGP for your custom routes. You can also use uh, next hop types like none, uh, as mentioned earlier, where you want the traffic to be dropped. You can also choose virtual network when you want to override the default routing within a virtual network. And you can specify internet as your next hop type when you want to explicitly route traffic destined to an address prefix to the internet, or if you want your traffic destined for Azure services with public IP addresses. Please note that you don't see VNet peering and VN virtual network service endpoint as the next hop type in the user defined routes. The reason being that routes within the virtual network peering and virtual network service endpoint next hop types 
are only created by Azure and they are configured automatically whenever you configure virtual network peering or a service endpoint. You can exchange border uh, gateway protocol or BGP routes between your on-prem network gateway and Azure virtual network gateway. It is used with VPN gateways of express route type. You must use BGP to advertise on-prem routes to the Microsoft Edge router. Important point to note here is that you cannot create user-defined routes to force traffic to the express route virtual network gateway if you deploy a virtual network gateway as type express route. But you can use user-defined routes for forcing traffic from the express route to, for example, a network virtual appliance. When you exchange routes with Azure using BGP, a separate route is added to the route table uh, of all the subnets in a virtual network for each uh, advertised prefix. The route is added with virtual network gateway listed as uh, both the source as well as the next hop type. Uh, remember the old, good old days when you needed a Jumbox VM to connect uh, uh, virtual machines in your virtual network? Well, those days are gone. You don't need a Jumpbox machine anymore. If you have not heard of, there is a new service called as Azure Bastion Service, which is a fully platform managed platform as a service that provides secure and seamless RDP or SSH connectivity to your virtual machines directly in the Azure portal over TLS. When you connect via Azure Bastion, your virtual machines do not need a public IP address and they can be connected over private IP addresses. Due to time constant, I would like to run through this section slightly fast. Uh, Azure provides many options to load balance your workloads. To start with, the first service you shall be aware of is an Azure load balancer which works at layer four. It distributes the inbound network traffic across a backend pool, which could have plain instances of virtual machines or a virtual machine scale set instances. There could be two types of load balancers, public and internal. As the name suggests, public load balancer is used for load balancing internet traffic to your virtual machines, whereas an internal load balancer is used for load balancing within a virtual network. For public load balancer, you need to use a public IP address for front-end configuration so that internet traffic can reach your load balancer. Whereas for internal load balancer, you need to use a private IP address. For load balancing, the network traffic among the different instances in the backend pool, a load balancer uses a five tuple hash, which comprises of source IP address, source port, destination IP address, destination port, and an IP protocol number to map your flows to the available server. For both types of the load balancer, Azure offers a basic SKU and a standard SKU that have different functional performance, security, and health tracking capabilities. The point to note here is that SKUs are not mutable, meaning once you create a load balancer with a specific SKU, you cannot change the SKU. You need to create a new balancer with the right SKU and migrate the configuration from the old load balancer. Another service you can use is Azure Traffic Manager, which uses DNS to direct client requests to the most appropriate service endpoint based on a traffic routing method and the health of the endpoints. An endpoint could be any internet facing service hosted inside or outside of Azure. The most important point to understand is that Traffic Manager works at a DNS level. Traffic Manager uses DNS to direct clients to specific service endpoints based on the rules of the traffic routing method. Technically, clients connect to the selected endpoint directly and not through the traffic manager. Traffic manager is not a proxy or a gateway, and it does not seize the traffic passing between the client and service. There are few uh, traffic routing methods uh, within our traffic manager that you can use, uh, starting from priority, which routes based on the priority of the endpoint, uh, weighted where traffic is distributed either evenly or according to the weights that you define, uh, you can use performance when you want end users to be routed to the closest endpoint in terms of lowest network latency. You can use geographic when your users are directed to when you want your users to be directed to specific endpoints based on their geographic locations. Likewise, you can use multi-value when you can have only IPv4 or IPv6 addresses as endpoints. Lastly, you can also use subnet traffic routing method to map sets of end user IP address ranges to a specific endpoint within a traffic manager profile. What you are seeing here is on the left, you see a system with priority routing in traffic manager, and to the right, you see a weighted routing. Uh, when primary app goes down or the primary endpoint goes down, under priority routing, the traffic is routed to the next app instance in order of priority, whereas in the second screenshot, when the primary site goes down, it sends the traffic based on the weights. 
Another service that you can use is known as Azure Front Door, which offers a layer seven load balancing capabilities for your application with instant failover. Azure Front Door is an application delivery network as a service. It comes with features like uh, DSA, dynamic site acceleration, TLS SSL offloading, uh, web application firewall, URI path based routing, and so on. Similar to Azure Fronto, there is another service known as Azure Application Gateway, which is a web traffic load balancer that enables you to manage traffic to your web applications. It is also a layer seven application layer load balancing solution. It also supports uh, centralized SSL offload and SSL policy. It supports a web integrated web application firewall, pretty much the same features that Azure Front Door provides. While both Front Door and Application Gateway are layer seven load balancer, there is a difference between the two services. Front Door is a global service, whereas Application Gateway is a regional service. While Front Door can load balance between your different scale units or clusters or stamp units across regions, Application Gateway allows you to load balance between your VMs on containers that is within the scale unit within the same region. So the scope between scope is the difference between application gateway and front door. Front door is global, whereas application gateway is regional. Traditional load balancers, when we have used a transport layer, uh, they generally operate at what I mean is generally operate at layer layer four at TCP and UDP. Whereas Azure application gateway, as I was mentioning earlier, works at layer seven. Uh, what that means is we can do URL based routing using Azure application gateway. Azure Application Gateway can make routing decisions based on additional attributes of an HTTP request, for example, URI path or host headers. For example, you can route traffic based on the incoming URL. So if images is in the incoming URL, you can route traffic to a specific set of servers configured for your images, likewise for videos. So when selecting a load balancing option, there are uh, some key factors to consider, uh, including what type of traffic is incoming, Glo whether it's a global versus regional service, how much it is going to cost me. I have uh, put a link there which you can go and refer to to uh, find out the best uh, load balancing option for your use case. And the service I want to touch upon is Azure Content Delivery Network, which is a distributed uh, network of servers that can efficiently deliver web content to the users. CDN store cached contents on edge servers in point of presence locations that are close to end users to minimize latency. What you, what you are seeing here in uh, the diagram is when a user at least requests the resource from the edge servers, and if there is no cached copy of that resource, the edge servers reach out to the origin, which could be a Azure web app service or an Azure storage. The origin returns back the requested resource, which ad servers pass it on to the LEs, and ad servers also store a cached copy of that, so that when any of the other users request the same uh, resource, if the ad servers have a cached copy of that resource, it returns it back. Otherwise, it again goes back to the origin and get back uh, updated copy. You should note here that at the edge servers, the time to live is by default seven days, but that is completely configurable. Moving on, uh, there are two different ways you can monitor your network in Azure. One of the services you can utilize is Azure Network Watcher, which you can use to monitor and diagnose health and performance of your network. Using Network Watcher's diagnostic and uh, visualization tools, you can capture packets for on a virtual machine, validate if an IP flow is allowed or denied. You can also identify things like where packets will be routed from a VM and gain insights to your all up network topology. And the screenshot that you are seeing is how you can see your network topology or virtual network topology within Azure Network Watcher. Lastly, there is another solution known as Network Performance Monitor, which is a cloud based hybrid network monitoring solution that helps you monitor network performance between various points in your network infrastructure. Network performance monitor detects network uh, issues like traffic black holing, routing errors, and issues that conventional network monitoring methods aren't able to detect. The solution generates alerts and notifies when a threshold is breached for a network link. It also ensures timely detection of network performance issues and localizes the source of the problem to a particular network segment or device. It comes with three broad capabilities, performance monitor, service connectivity monitor, and express route monitor. Performance monitor monitors the network connectivity between 
cloud deployments and your on-prem locations, multiple data centers and branch offices, service connectivity, monitor monitors the connectivity from your users to the services that you care about, determining what infrastructure is in the path and identifying where network bottlenecks are, and express out monitor monitors end-to-end -end connectivity and performance between your branch offices and Azure over Azure Express Route. Uh, here are some of the uh, resources that you can refer to for your Azure networking uh, learning. To start with, Azure Architecture Center is the is a great resource which lists all the reference architectures and the architectural best practices you should follow for your Azure networking. Uh, Microsoft Azure documentation uh, is your source of authority. It's, it's, it is always up to date and you can get first hand information. Uh, Microsoft has listed some best practices for your network security. Uh, do check it out. Uh, there is a great resource called as Microsoft Learn, which has good learning paths across different Azure services. They have a learning path on Azure networking as well. Do check it out. Then Microsoft has also partnered with Microsoft for 200 uh, plus free courses on Azure, which you can access uh, using a free account. Uh, check out a, a show called Azure Friday hosted by Scott Henselman, where they cover different uh, Azure services, including most of the Azure networking services. It's a cool show where they have uh, short videos on each of the services. Lastly, if you are interested, you should also check out Azure role based certifications, which can help you in learning more about Azure. With that, I want to quickly go uh, to uh, my Azure portal. I will quickly demonstrate uh, whatever we have spoken in our presentation before I wrap it up. When you, I'm showing my Azure portal, I have already logged in into uh, using my live ID through which I have a subscription. I'm into my dashboard right now in my home page in Azure portal. If I go to create a resource on my left side and go under the networking, I can create all the different uh, resource types that we have spoken in our presentation. For the sake of this demo, I've already created a resource group here. I will go ahead and show you how to create a virtual network. Select virtual network under new. Click create. Choose the subscription that you want your virtual network to go in the resource group. Give a name. And the region that you want it to be created. I want it to go in East US 2. Specify the IP address ranges for your virtual network. Uh, by default, it picks it up uh, one of the address ranges that are available, but you can add multiple IP address ranges here. Right here, I've given it is opted for 10.0.0.0 slash 16, which is the highest uh, I, prefix that I can opt for. As you can see, it has 65,536 addresses here. It has a it comes with a default subnet with slash 24 prefix. I can add multiple subnets which within this IP address range, but I, for the demo purpose, I'll stay with the default subnet that it creates for me. I can go ahead and enable DDoS protection. As I said, by default, basic is enabled, uh, but I can opt for standard as well, which is, uh, which is a pay-as-you-go service. For firewall, I can either enable it or keep it disabled. If for now I'm going to keep it disabled, I can enable it at any time at virtual network level later. I leave the text as is and let me review my virtual network and create it. It's going to take a few seconds or a minute before it creates a resource. The resource is created. You can see here the different options. Here is our address space. If you uh, need to extend your virtual network by adding additional address ranges, you can add it under the address space here. Once you uh, connect your uh, different Azure services or Azure resources within this virtual network, they will show up here under connected devices. Here is the subnet that I have created while creating my virtual network. I can create additional subnets by clicking plus subnet here and give the subnet some ranges. I can assign the network security group on my subnet. I can choose the appropriate route table if I have to. I can select a service endpoint if I have to set it up for my subnet. And what you are seeing here is I was mentioning when I was talking about VPN gateway that it creates a gateway subnet within the virtual network that hosts all the virtual, uh, all the VPN gateway resources. You can create a gateway subnet here or it automatically gets created when you uh, 
create a VPN gateway and assign it to a virtual network. You can change a DDoS protection from basic to standard and vice versa anytime through DDoS protection blade. You can enable your fire. You can add a firewall in your virtual network anytime using this page. Coming back to peering, I don't have a second virtual network, but this is a place where you can add additional virtual. You can add virtual network peering with your additional virtual network. You can give the name for a virtual network peering. You can choose the subscription and the virtual network that you want to peer with. Uh, what it does is you it automatically adds peering on the other network as well so that our virtual networks can talk with each other. Uh, there are different options you can see here. The first two options are whether you want to allow virtual network ex access from VNet1 to the uh, remote virtual network or the second virtual network or from and vice versa. You can also uh, allow forward traffic from remote virtual network to the virtual network one and so on. What it means is generally the first two options is for the traffic between the VNets which are peered, whereas if the VNets uh, peers are again connected to other virtual networks and you want traffic to be forwarded from one virtual network to the other virtual network peers, you can enable these options. And you can, if you have a VPN gateway assigned to your virtual network, you can also allow gateway transit here so that your virtual network peers can use your remote gateways. Here is your service endpoints where you can create uh, different service endpoints for your virtual network. You can opt for any of the available services that you can hook it up here. Your private endpoints when you create it in Azure for any of the Azure services list are listed here. You can configure your uh, diagnostic settings here and migrate all your dump all your logs, including metrics and DM protection alerts to either log analytics storage account or you can stream it to an event hub. Here is your VNet topology diagram that shows up here. You can also, since I only have a VNet one with a default subnet here, once I start assigning my uh, virtual machine resources here, it though will start showing up here. I can see the same topology under the network watcher as well. Uh, with that, uh, I conclude my presentation and I would open the floor for any questions that you might have. If not, I would like to thank Hugo once again for giving me opportunity to speak at this cloud lunch and learn session. I hope you will find it uh, helpful. Hi, Vabaf. Uh, yeah, actually we have a few questions here. Um, so I'll, I'll start by enumerating uh, each one of the questions. So the first question is, uh, what's the main difference between load balancer traffic manager and application gateway? Uh, the primary difference is uh, how they work. For example, load balancer works at layer four, whereas uh, application gateway and front door works at layer seven. Application gateway is at regional level, whereas front door is a global service. And uh, if we'll head out to this link, it gives you different load balancing options and uh, the criteria you should consider when you should be using different services. OK, um, we have let's pick one more question. So what are the main features of uh, WAF web application firewall? I can take this question for Frederick. So basically uh, the WAF service, apart from the load balancing features, it provides mm -hmm. you as well features such as routing, so you can route the traffic to your applications uh, mm -hmm. using rules in terms of uh, URL rules or even a by IP and so on. So it's basically a WAF, you know. Uh, OK, thank you. I, I will look into more into the Internet. Uh, if you share the are you going to share the uh, PowerPoint? I'm going to share my slide deck with Hugo and I think he's okay. going to share it with the community and uh, I think the session is also recorded and will be uploaded in the YouTube channel. Yes, okay. yes, the session will be recorded and also we will have uh, the slides available on on our uh, GitHub re repository so you can access the slides anytime. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's wrap, wrap up uh, so. Please, in case you did not have a chance uh, to do it in the beginning of the session, I would like to share with you this opportunity provided by Microsoft. 
to access free relevant materials related to this session. Uh, in order to access these materials, you can scan the QR codes or access the aka.ms AKA link in these slides and fill in a quick form. It is important to us for us to that you do the registration so you'll be officially registered in this session and it's a way to justify the efforts from our collaborators and ourselves to keep these initiatives. So please uh, take any minutes and register to the form, please. And I think we should be fine to close it up. Uh, um, I just shared already the link on the channel. So I shared the link for our forms as well, uh, where you can provide us uh, feedback about this session and also uh, suggest uh, any topics for future sessions so we can deliver content that are relevant to yourselves. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Vava, for delivering this great session. And thank you, everyone, to join and dedicate your time with us on this session. I hope you enjoyed the session and we really appreciate your feedback so we can improve our sessions and also deliver future sessions related to the topics that are useful and of your interest. Next week, uh, we will have another session with Michael Levin uh, talking about Azure Kubernetes service. So please stay tuned and join us next week and have a great day and thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.